Hi, I am Franny Brewer, and I'm the Communications Director for the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, as we are all only too aware, especially here on the Big Island, invasive species are a huge issue in our state, affecting our environment, our economy, our health, our way of life. And so to garner more attention to this issue, February has been designated Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Uh, the Hawaii Invasive Species Council and many partners, including BISC, are presenting this series of webinars on a variety of topics. Um, there's a link that uh, is in the chat right now that you can go to to see the various presentations that are available throughout the month. Um, tomorrow and Friday, our colleagues over in Maui are presenting on some of their work. At 2 p.m. on Thursday, learn more about the fight against pampas grass, which we are proud to declare eradicated from the Big Island. So it's one of our um, exciting pieces of news from last year. Um, next week, we're moving into the Kakai zone, and we'll be having a series of talks on aquatic invasive species issues. Um, on Thursday, BISC will actually be sponsoring a talk at lunchtime, 1230 on toxoplasmosis in monk seals. So we're going to have our friends from the um, NOAA uh, monk seal recovery team um, coming to join us for that. And they will also be joining us uh, on next Tuesday, our evening web webinar next Tuesday night where we'll be talking a lot about cat behavior. Um, we have some representatives from Hawaiian Humane joining us for that uh, to talk about a pro program that we've been working on, really looking at human behavior with cats and how we can really improve the situation with cats on the landscape in Hawaii. Um, if you missed any talks that you look back on that on that chat uh the link that's in the chat and you think oh my gosh i really wanted to see that do not fret all these webinars are being recorded and you can find them on the hisk youtube channel so that link is about to go up in the chat so if you if really want to make it a, an all-nighter, you can just watch webinars all night tonight that are all about invasive species. And tonight's webinar is also being recorded. It's going to be up on that YouTube in a couple of days, and it will also be on our BISC YouTube. And I'm going to have Jade put the link for the BISC YouTube in there just to give us a little plug. So Big Island Invasive Species is your host for tonight's research update on two-line spittlebug. And so I would like to go ahead and introduce our team that's handling the tech tonight. Jade Miyashiro, say hi to the folks at home. Hi. So Jade's going to be handling our recording and all of our tech issues. And she is about to launch a poll. Uh, so while we're doing, doing this uh, sort of intro roundup, if folks could just go ahead and answer those poll questions, would much appreciate it. Um, so on Facebook, we also have Kavehi Lopez Young. Kavehi, say hi. Aloha. And so Kavehi is going to be tracking any of the, um, if, if you have any questions or anything like that on Facebook, please go ahead and you can type those in and she'll make sure those get to the presenters. Um, Jade's going to be tracking the questions on Zoom here for those in our Zoom room using the question and answer feature or the chat. Um, and we will make sure to get those to the presenters. We're going to have our presentations first and then we're going to save our questions for the end. Um, so, getting to the main event, we are really excited to have this great team of folks here tonight to talk about one of the most substantial threats to our agricultural economy in Hawaii. Um, the two-line spittlebug was first identified in 2016 on a ranch, ranch in South Kona. It's native to the mainland United States, and it's known as a pasture and golf course pest there, but it had never before been seen here in Hawaii. It has spread at an almost unimaginably fast rate over the last several years absolutely consuming pastures, turning them into weed wastelands that offer no forage for cattle. Um, so we're going to start with a little bit of a video, about a two minute video here uh, that goes over some of the, just kind of gives you an overview and has some visuals on that. And then we're going to get into our presentations. But we want to, I do want to share this with folks. If you'll give me a second to share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right. I cannot emphasize more strongly just how important it is that Hawaii really improve its biosecurity. You know, this is not a rancher problem. This is a statewide problem. This is the state's problem. It is a pest that will affect 
a lot of different communities on the island. All of a sudden, my eyes opened to the extent of what was going on. I'm out there every single day for the last six years, and I still don't know how to get rid of this thing. It's very unlikely, I think I could even say safely, probably impossible, that we're going to get rid of this problem. Because there's no stopping it. My heart really sank. And I realized that this is going to change our lives forever. The destruction is so great in a, such a small amount of time, and it's just going to get worse. I realize the extent of our infestation. We have been totally infested. It's like a huge fire, and, and I only have a garden hose. Everyone thinks they can battle it, but when it comes to you, there's no way you can battle it. Right now, we're nowhere near stopping this thing. It's very frustrating. It could really decimate the ranching industry. Right now, it's catastrophic. It would affect a lot of people. God forbid it gets to one of the other islands. It's not if, it's when it gets here. It could be just economically catastrophic for the cattle industry. I just, I fear for that. This is going to be the worst thing that ever happens to ranching in South Kona. If this deal really hits this side of the island, we, we, we're going to need all the help we can get. My life as a rancher is going to change forever. From this insect, we've had other influences to agriculture and ranching, but I think this two-line spittlebug might top them all. As long as we're aware of it, then I think that's the biggest thing. If we don't improve our biosecurity, the future of agriculture in Hawaii gets bleaker and bleaker every day. Okay, kind of a sobering way to start this out, but we're really uh, hoping that some of our speakers tonight are going to give us uh, some hope. <laughs> Looking for some hope. Aloha. Uh, this is... I don't know what's happening. Okay, it was going to the next YouTube video. Um, Okay, so our very first speaker tonight, you'll recognize from that video, um, and we have a couple of folks here that are that are in that video. First up, we have Mark Thorne, who is going to give us an update on the current two-line spittlebug situation and the distribution of the insect right now. Uh, Mark is the state range and livestock extension specialist for the University of Hawaii Manoa Cooperative Extension, known as CTAR. Um, his research and extension programs focus on the ecology of rangelands, invasive pest management strategies, and sustainable grazing and livestock management. Um, he has been working on the TLSB problem since 2017. Mark, how are you doing tonight? Franny, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. How, <laughs> how have things been going with TLSB? What do you got for us? Yeah, well, um, it's been a uh, a busy season and and now it's in diapause so we can take a little bit of a breath prep for the next uh next season that will probably start about march and april and uh, i've uh put together a presentation that goes into a little bit more depth in in terms of um covering some of the research and our future uh focus as well um Great, you can go ahead and, and screen share when you're ready. Okay. Your audio is a little weak. I don't know if there's any way you can adjust your mic. I'll just speak up a little bit. I don't have any adjustments in my mic, so. All right, so um, as Franny introduced me, I'm Mark Thorne, specialist in range and livestock management for the University of Hawaii. And I'm gonna talk uh, to you a little bit about our two-line spittlebug project, um, give you kind of an overview of the current situation, our research and future plans. Um, so, um, So uh, I think you you know a little bit just to recap what what uh, Franny had had briefed you on uh, the two line spittle bug was recorded on the island of Hawaii in 2016 in the Kailua Kona area um, it caused some significant damage uh, in, in some pastures um, this this 
species of skittle bug is native to the southeast United States, where it has long been recognized as a pest of pastures and grass turf. In Hawaii, the pest has rapidly spread and now infests just under 180,000 acres uh, and threatens the livestock industry in the state. Kikuyu grass and pangola grass, among some others that make up most of our forage base for the cattle industry in the state, have uh, proven to be very uh, susceptible to spittlebug feeding and quickly die out when two-line spittlebug adult, adult populations reach critical levels. Uh, the loss of these grasses creates an environment conducive to the rapid colonization of many noxious weeds, including pomacani, wild blackberry, fireweed, healed grass, and many others. As a result of this rapid conversion of two-line spittlebug affected rangelands, ranches have been forced to drastically reduce livestock numbers due to the lack of suitable forage and placing a financial strain on the sustainability of their operations. Consequently, this pest poses a major threat to Hawaii's pasture-based livestock industry. So uh, monthly survey data collected along Transex established beginning in 2017, highlighted here in the green, uh, in the green dots here, uh, and revealed that the pest uh, has been expanding its range at about 35,000 acres per year. Uh, initial estimates of the pest range in 2016, when we first recorded it, covered uh, just under 30,000 acres. Um, but by the fall of uh, 2021, this past fall, uh, the pest could be found within a 170,000, 178,000 acre area from Puvava in the north all the way to Honaunau in the south. It's rapidly expanded, expanded its range. And, uh, and continues to do so. Um, now, I know this graph is a little bit busy, but uh, it shows the two-line spittlebug population dynamics between February 2018 through January of this year, as measured through nymph density counts, along with associated photos of the plant community composition for key points of time in time at, our, uh, at one of our transects. Um, that is shown here in the blue. So pay attention to this. Um, Kikuyu grass uh, made up about 85% of the pasture composition in May of 2018, when the first two-line spittlebug were uh, detected along this transect. Um, by November of 2019, Kikuyu grass had made up only 2% of the plant cover, while fireweed and other invasive plants made up the remaining 95%. Now, between uh, that November uh, 2019 and, and January of 2022, um, we have seen a little bit of recovery at this transect since uh, uh, you know, with a combination of uh, reduced uh, two-line spittlebug pressure that was seen in, in 2020 um, and an increase in uh, Yorkshire fog, which um, as of January of of uh, 2022 made up about 55% of the forage base uh, or the grass base uh, of, of the pasture composition, excuse me. And Yorkshire fog is a C3 forage grass that largely evades spittlebug uh, feeding uh, as it primarily grows in the winter and spring when two-line spittlebug uh, is basically dormant. These are these peri uh, periods here from uh, usually running from November to about March uh, that the pest is in diapause. Um, the active period of the pest, we've determined, uh, runs somewhere between March and uh, the first part of November, typically, but it can be narrower uh, as it was in 2019 um, on temperature and, and uh, a couple other uh, factors, including soil moisture. Okay, so our current project work, um, uh, we basically, um, we received funding for this project in 2017 for the, from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, and Hawaii Invasive Species Council, Hawaii, uh, and Hawaii County. Um, and since that time, we've received additional uh, funding through HDOA and Hawaii Invasive Species Council um, to continue the work. We, uh, these grants uh, have supported a number of project objectives, uh, including outreach and education, 
the field surveys that we just discussed, uh, development of integrated pest management protocols, uh, biological control agent exploration, and research in into the biology and ecology of tree line spittlebone. Um, on the front of integrated pest management strategies, the, um, we've used the monthly field surveys uh, to develop an understanding of the population dynamics of the pest and its biology and ecology. Uh, and utilizing this uh, knowledge, we've uh, developed a series of management guidelines for the pest. Um, they are just now coming online and will be released through the extension publications and other outreach materials and will be included in a two-line spittlebug smartphone application that will provide a decision support portal, which is dedicated, depicted in these uh, screenshots from the, from the app. Uh, basically, the app allows a user to quantify the two-line spittlebug population and based on nymph densities by age class, determine if or when damage by adult spittlebugs will reach a critical level and then choose and implement appropriate management protocols. And we expect to release this app uh, later this year. I'm not gonna cover too much of the research. You're gonna hear uh, uh, more about that from our graduate student, Shannon Wilson, uh, but our research has focused on post-plant resistance trials, uh, damage threshold trials. Uh, we've done some work on, on various pesticides and, uh, and some uh, nominal work on biological control. Uh, on, on the outreach side of this, we've, uh, we've developed, a, uh, we've provided a number of uh, workshops. Uh, this got limited because of COVID-19. Um, we've also developed uh, a, a website on our Hawaii rangeland uh, webpage for two lines fiddlebug. Um, and uh, in cooperation with BISC and NRCS, we, we helped uh, develop some RAC cards. Uh, and, seri uh, and a series of presentations, one of which um, we've seen uh, right before this presentation. And um, recently we completed a, a project planning and, and budget for the next five years. And, and I'm gonna cover that uh, just a little bit here to kind of give you an idea of where we're looking. So we feel it's vital to continue to conduct monthly field surveys of new and existing two-line spittlebug populations as it yields valuable data on population dynamics and impacts, and it helps us monitor trends in behavior and adaptation and provides data to map population distribution, densities, uh, and vectors of movement. We will continue to carry out the various trials underway and expand that work to include many more uh, grasses. Two new areas we plan to start work on include investigating silica fertilization as a potential cultural practice to increase damage resistance of existing pastures. The second area is in integrated pest management uh, strategy that uh, is to begin investigating two-line spittlebug egg, egg ecology, including oviposit, site uh, selection, diapause timing and duration, and environmental hatch requirements. We're gonna expand our field trials that uh, into forage plots that we spent uh, this past spring and summer establishing. Uh, these will pro provide us with information on habitat selectivity, tolerance, resistance of different grasses under grazed and ungrazed conditions. And we will also begin some field scale pesticide trials. And we feel with the current data we have, we are ready to begin uh, research in two new areas. The first is to conduct ecological niche modeling. This will allow us to develop a habitat suitability rating and predict the risk of two-line spittlebug invasion and predict the timing and potential damage levels for a given land unit. The second area is to use uh, satellite imagery and normalize difference vegetation index to develop models for rapid detection of new outbreaks, map the scale and, uh, and damage levels of outbreaks, detect movement vectors and enhance biosecurity efforts and improve assessment of damage and economic scale of loss and recovery. Uh, so just to briefly summarize, two-line spittlebug has had a significant impact on rangelands in the Kailua Kona area, and it is spreading at about 35,000 acres per year. As such, it is a significant threat to the livestock industry, rangelands, and the ecosystem services they support, conservation efforts, and tangentially 
critical to continue to carry out research and extension outreach efforts uh, and the development of IPM protocols. Tonight's Spittlebug issue is not just a rancher issue, it is a state issue. There needs to be a coordinated effort to control the pest and provide assistance to the ranchers who are on the front line of controlling. With that, I'd like to uh, just thank our two line Spittlebug team and our partners. Uh, aside from myself is Dr. Mark Wright, uh, Dr. Dan Peck, Melanie Oshiro, Shannon Wilson, Justin Ye, Elizabeth Whitney, Yoshiaki Higashidi, and our funding has come from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, Hawaii Invasive Species Council, Hawaii County, and the USDA ARS. Questions, you can contact me by phone or by email. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. It sounds like uh, you have a lot going on and I'm sure that people have questions. So please go ahead and type your questions into the chat, the Q&A, or if you're on Facebook, right into the discussion. And we will get those to Mark at the end. We're gonna go through all of the presenters first, just so if you have questions that might get answered by your, your uh, next presenter, um, who is again, a facial recognized from the video we started with. Our next speaker is Carolyn Oveloa. She is the state rangeland, rangeland management specialist for NRCS Pacific Islands. And Carolyn's work is aimed at developing conservation solutions to natural resources problems on grazing lands in the Pacific Islands. Um, Carolyn, your team has been testing light traps and doing forage experiments and all kinds of stuff. So really looking forward to what you have to share with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Franny. Can you hear me okay? okay yep, great. sounds good. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. Let me get my PowerPoint up and share my screen. Okay, here we go. Um, Franny, does that look okay? Okay. I can see that you've started screen sharing, but I'm not seeing your actual presentation. Maybe okay. A black screen. Let me try one more time. Okay. And I see that there's a lot of stuff in the chat there, more resources that folks can go to. So be sure to be checking out that chat window. Um, as we go along. Okay. Did it work that time? Why don't you try doing the presentation view and see if it pops up? Okay. Apologies. Are you um, choosing, um, are you on PowerPoint or? Yeah, yeah, I'm on PowerPoint and I tried just sharing the screen that it is on um, the first time. And then I tried sharing the application PowerPoint slideshow the second time. Mm. Try, it's the first way usually works. So let me just try it one more time. Try advancing the slide, see if uh, maybe it's just. I think. No, still a black screen. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, one more time. And then if not, I'll just, you'll just have to hear me talk. <laughs> oh, there it goes. There it goes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Does it give you my, give you my title, my uh, title slide now? Yep. Looks great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to be uh, invited to this and just to share a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, you know, uh, our, we've been trying really hard to um, be working alongside Mark and complimenting, you know, he's doing such a great job in studying the, the details of the biology and um, the nuances of the bug and, and some of the problems that it's causing. And I'm just so thrilled about his um, forage resistance trials now that he has going on. Um, our work with uh, producers that are outside the spittle bug area, they're very concerned about detecting it should it, you know, when it arrives. And um, we, we field a few calls from folks that are um, concerned and want us to come out and check. <clears throat> and uh, that kind of led to the development of the idea of developing light traps. 
light traps, we hope we will be able to deploy them and have them be a um, way of maybe early detection of, lo of, of low levels of spittle bug. When you, they first arrive in an area, it can be difficult to find them, um, especially if the pasture is large, but we do know that they do have a strong attraction to light. Um, and in previous research projects, um, that's how they, that is, those are methods that they've used for um, detecting them. So that led to that. And then on the flip side, uh, producers that already have the spittle bug are always, are very much interested in um, figuring out strategies for how to recover their pastures that they that are being impacted and the grasses that they're losing. So that leads to our pasture planting projects. Um, <clears throat> Kona, the area that's been impacted so far is a pretty challenging environment for planting grass. It's very rocky and um, there's a lot of young soils. And so we've had to be a little more creative um, with methods that we've been trying. So with that, um, first, uh, this is what we've been up to, our light traps. This is our first version. We're trying to keep them very low cost and low tech. Um, we're not trying to create something that is not, not going to be affordable um, and easily um, duplicated should we find a design that's really effective. This was our first attempt where we kind of had a light shining down into a bucket of water. And we did succeed in catching the occasional spittle bug. But there were definitely some weaknesses in this design. My technician and I worked together and brainstormed some other ideas. And he came up with this fantastic design, which is modeled more directly off of um, the kind that the researchers use. And he was just very resourceful in using um, easy to find materials that we could get a hold of here. Um, we've tried two iterations of this. We have a, a solar powered black light um, here in the center of the trap that in previous research um, was seemed to be the most attractive light for the for the spittle bug. And we've tried it with both sticky surfaces um, on the panels that the light is mounted in, as well as having a water catch at the bottom. And we had significantly more catch with this trap, um, a lot of bycatch, but we also did have a few spittle bugs in here. We, we finalized this design at the end of the spittle bug season last year. And so the numbers, I think, were really dropping off. We're um, looking forward to getting a few of these deployed as the season starts to ramp up and we have um, spittle bugs starting to emerge. So we're going to be testing this again. And once, um, once we have them, uh, once we have the design finalized, we have some plans for um, areas on the outside of the known range um, where we have some folks that have contacted us previously with some concern and if they'll agree to let us put them out there that's what we plan to do and to um, just again kind of come alongside and help a little bit more with the monitoring of the spread. All right <clears throat> um, moving on to our planting trials um, we started our first planting trials back in June of 2020 a lot of what we're finding is as the pastures get impacted by spittle bug, they get the grasses get um, weakened and move, they move out and other undesirable plants move in. In this picture is a good example. This pasture has been completely overtaken by helo grass and blackberry and um, other weeds. So the producer worked with us. We, we tried a couple of different ideas out here. Um, our first attempt was to do chemical suppression. We used chemical, um, sorry, let me go back to that. We used a, a light application of herbicide to suppress the existing grasses. This grass was on its way out. It was dying and we um, spread um, Marandu grass seed at uh, different seeding rates across this landscape when part of it we dragged after seeding and part of it we just did the broadcast, just trying to do methods that may be um, scalable um, for ranchers. Um, and, and trying different methods because different people have different situations. This rancher had a nice flat area. She could get in here with equipment uh, to some degree, but the soils are too shallow for traditional um, agronomic types of planting. Um, so we put in our trial, we planted everything. And in the first two months after planting, we had almost two feet of rain. It rained every day. And in these pictures, I actually had a, a, a little stream running through this property. Um, a lot of our seed, I believe, washed away. So we um, we had a lot of uh, weeds also come up. This was almost 100% sedge at this point, and other wetland weeds came in. Um, but we we continued this trial. We had initially started it with two blocks. One of them were completely ruined. We had to replant. And this one, we decided to let it run just to kind of see how it turned out, especially with the different seeding rates that we had tried. Here are the fields at um, five months after planting and 12 months after planting. And we did get some of the grass that we wanted, but we had 
a lot, a lot of weed competition. And in the end, um, we weren't, weren't entirely uh, satisfied with our results. So we're glad we had a second trial um, already started. But we did go ahead and gather data on this one. And I, I'm not sure what we're going to finally do with this data because I think the results are significantly affected again by that those flooding conditions. Um, the the blocks this this data is presented in um, the way that we kind of set up the blocks in the field, and so these bottom six blocks are more or less where we had the water running right through um, those those plots. So, yeah, the, the data came out funky, but you can see some of the some of the plots that we did plant we ended up with a fair amount of grass cover um, at three times the seeding rate. We had about 80% grass after after one year, which is definitely better than <laughs> better than the lower end of the spectrum. Um, but the results were kind of inconsistent. We tried to run some, some basic statistics on it and we really weren't very happy um, with how it turned out, but it's interesting and uh, good for discussion nonetheless. In our second iteration of this project, um, with the weeds, I mean, with the rain, we got the flush of weeds, a lot of wetland weeds. We went in and again, suppressed it with a light application of herbicide. And this time we tried um, broadcasting seed over the dead standing weeds. And on one part of the, our, our plots, we had the producer, she could get in and mow it. So she mowed the dead weeds down. And in the other, and then I had her leave one section alone and not mow it. So at three months, with no mowing, you can see we have a little bit more weeds coming up. And at three months with the mowing, we already started to see evidence that the mowing made a big difference on the, uh, the success of germination of the grass seed that we had scattered. We did the same thing by planting at three different planting rates, the standard planting rate, twice the rate, and three times the rate. At five months, the differences were more, even more pronounced with just a ton of weed competition in the sites that had not been mowed after um, they had been killed. And the sites that had been mowed, we just got really excited because we were having a lot of grass plants come up. And these Morandu plants can get fairly large, especially in places with rainfall that's like this um, in this area. And um, at seven months, we were even happier. Um, again, the no mow plots really looked pretty, pretty sad with a lot of weeds, but we some of the grass plants made it. But the mode plots had just fantastic cover of grass. And the grasses were suppressing the weeds and starting to smother them out. And that is the kind of results that we're after. So we are working to see um, it's a limited, limited application to folks that actually have lands that are mowable. But for those that do, this is a really um, pretty low, um, uh, low disturbance um, method that is, is hopefully going to help some folks recover some pasture and get them back into production. We collected some data again. This represents um, line intercept cover on the, the different um, plots. And so we have our mode plots on the left side of the screen and our, our not mode plots on the right. And you can see the different seeding rates that are presented across there. Um, <clears throat> what I found really fascinating was that across all the mode plots, even down at the one at the standard seeding rate, we had, you know, 69 to 88% grass cover at the end of, um, this was after seven months. Um, and at higher seeding rates, we had even better, um, but the seed costs are significant. And so it's really um, important that we try and explore um, and figure out kind of where the breaking points are. What's the minimum we can do and have acceptable results? And so this was really promising. Um, I'd like to try to repeat this again. And we're still working with this producer and monitoring these sites to see how they um, continue to perform um, over time. The not mode sites, kind of like the pictures depicted, we had a lot more weeds, a lot less grass cover. Um, at the higher seeding rates, we did get better grass establishment, but it was still um, uh, it, it took three times the amount of seed to get results that were comparable to what we had at one time the seeding rate in the mode plot. So if a producer has the ability to do this, um, this may be a viable way method for um, trying to reestablish re some good forage grasses that are not susceptible to the two-line spittle bug. This Marandu grass, um, that's why, why we chose it, was because we expect that it will survive the two-line spittle bug. And then um, in another phase, in another 
um, because not everybody can mow. And uh, a lot of these lands are very difficult to access with any kind of equipment um, besides a bulldozer. Um, we are also trying some other, other techniques. Um, there's a technology that is used um, in different applications on the mainland, uh, creating these seed balls with a type of clay material and fiber and inoculating those, those, these things with seeds. And so with another rancher we're working with, um, they agreed to let us put in some, some seed balls to try a, a, another planting trial. So here we had had them have, um, kind of graze down the cover and we scattered some seed balls. You can see a few of them are here in the picture. And then at the same time, we're comparing seed balls and broadcasting. So we've got plots set up where we put seed balls in and then we've um, calibrated and measured out approximately the same amount of grass seed. And we've broadcast those in um, uh, duplicate plots um, within our, our area. This study is still ongoing. Uh, we are still monitoring and we don't have the data yet on this. Um, we are observing a lot of a lot of weed competition. Uh, we're going to observe this plot for until um, June. We'll do our final assessment on it and uh, make a make a decision on whether we think this is a viable uh, path or not. Uh, we did observe initial germination early on, and that was that was exciting. Um, and we have this type of study going on um, at uh, two different ranches and at uh, various different um, sites. Um, they're varying with elevation, rainfall, uh, competing vegetation and whatnot. So we're hopeful, we're hopeful that um, we will find, you know, one of the uh, different methods that can be applied in different circumstances in order to help producers recover their pastures. And that's all I have. Um, it's just short and sweet, just some preliminary um, work that we're doing, and I'm happy to take any questions at the end. That was fantastic, Carolyn. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I just love how creative you guys are being and really trying to keep in mind the cost and the accessibility and all those other pieces to it. So it's just fantastic. But yeah, if anybody has any questions, please sure just, just enter those in and we will get to those at the end. Um, we have one final presentation from the science folks tonight, um, and that was pre-recorded for us by Shannon Wilson, who's on Mark's team but couldn't be here tonight. She's traveling, so uh, she very thoughtfully recorded um, uh, her presentation for us, and she's going to talk about um, a really critical aspect uh, for the future of ranching in Hawaii, um, you know, again, with what going off of what Carolyn was talking about, those grasses that need to be replaced. So she's working on um, she's working on that project. I was looking for her. Ah, yes, she is a PhD student at UH Manoa and her thesis research is on TLSB biology, ecology and management. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share her pre recorded presentation. Uh, hopefully this will go well. Hi, my name is Shannon Wilson. I'm a PhD entomology student in the Plant and Environmental Protection Sciences Department in the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources at UH Manoa. I work under Dr. Mark Wright and Dr. Mark Thorne, and I'll be providing an update on two-line spittlebug host plant resistance research. Host plant resistance is widely accepted as the most effective method to combat spittlebugs. This is because it's low cost, sustainable, environmentally sound, has a cumulative effect, can be easily incorporated into ranches, and is compatible with other tactics. Incorporation of two-line spittlebug resistant grasses may be a promising management strategy for Hawaii. Considering 70% of the cattle in the state are raised on highly susceptible Kikuyu Pangola grass pastures, it will be necessary to incorporate more tolerant and resistant grass species. Additionally, management tactics employed in other regions are not as compatible as host plant resistance. For example, controlled burning, which is implemented in Georgia, would be too risky for the multitude of native species and forests interspersed with the rangelands. Also, chemical control is quite costly and difficult to apply over thousands of hectares of pasture land, and it needs to be able to penetrate through the spittle mass that protects the nymphs. 
Additionally, once adult damage becomes evident, it's often too late to apply because the adult population will already be dead. Because host plant resistance is a promising strategy for management, I've been carrying out greenhouse experiments for the last two years, assessing the tolerance of different grass species to adult spittlebug herbivory. This is the visual damage scale I used. It is a one to six scale with categories for resistance, tolerance, and susceptibility. So anything that had less than 25% foliar damage fell in the resistant category. 25 to 50% foliar damage was considered to be tolerant and anything with over 50% damage fell in the susceptible category. In 2020, I assessed six different grass species. So the blue is representing the uninfested control plants and the red is the infested plants. The grass with the highest average damage rating was Kikuyu. So it was the most susceptible of the six species. Conversely, the most resistant species was Murandu. This was followed by Orchard, Signal, and Limpo Big Alta. These images really help depict how susceptible Kikuyu grass is. On the left, I'm showing the uninfested control on day zero versus day 12. And then on the right is the infested Kikuyu on day zero versus day 12. And after 12 days of adult spittlebug feeding, the kikuyu grass was 100% dead. The resistant Murandu had a little to no difference between the uninfested control plant and the infested plant on day 12. In 2021, I assessed nine different grass species. And again, kikuyu grass was the most susceptible out of all the species. The Yorkshire fog ended up being the only one in the tolerant category, and the other seven species actually fell in the resistant category, which is pretty promising. So again, across both years, kikuyu grass was the most susceptible species. It had an average damage rating of 5.19 in 2020 and 4.78 in 2021. Yorkshire fog had a high amount of variation in the damage across the experimental plant units. So many ended up looking like this tolerant plant with about 25 to 50% damage, whereas many other plants appeared susceptible with over 50% damage. So the average damage rating for Yorkshire fog was 2.96. The most resistant species in 2021 was Mulatto 2, which had an average rating of 1.54. It had very little difference between the uninfested versus infested plant on day 12. The second most resistant species in the 2021 trials was Murandu, which was the most resistant in 2020. And it had average damage ratings of 1.27 in 2020 and 1 1.6 in 2021. The rest of the photos I'll be showing are all also resistant grasses. Um, this is Bahia T9, which had an average damage rating of 1.63. Then we have Kayana and Cayman with average ratings of 1.65 and 1.67 respectively. And finally, Sabia and Fountain had average damage ratings of 1.69 and 1.73. So the fact that there were seven different grass species that fell in the resistance category is pretty 
promising for the future and the use of host plant resistance as a management strategy for the two line spittle bug. Another experiment I carried out was assessing varying levels of adult infestation on Kikuyu grass. So the response of Kikuyu grass to five adults resulted in some damage, but the plant was not 100% dead. Whereas at 10 and 15 adults, the grass is nearly 100% dead. So the significant threshold for Kikuyu survivability to an attack appears to be 10 adults per square foot. The next step will be to determine if the resistance observed in the greenhouse will translate to the field. In order to test this, we established nine field plots containing eight different grass species across an elevation gradient. This will hopefully give us some insight as to whether the two-line spittle bug has a preference for certain grass species and if those species will be tolerant or resistant in the field. Also, we want to see if these different varieties can tolerate the highly variable growing conditions across the ranches. Additionally, we will be adding in a grazing component to assess the impacts of cattle grazing on nymph microclimate, which may indirectly impact the nymph population. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can contact Mark Thorne. Okay, that was awesome. I really appreciate that Shen was able to do that for us. And um, again, if you do have any questions about her presentation, she's on Mark's team. So I'm sure Mark, you could take care of that for us. Uh, before we get to questions, I would like to have one more speaker. We have Nicole Galisi, who is the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council uh, Managing Director, and she is fighting for our island ranchers to help protect the Paniolo way of life and the many jobs that depend on ranching in the state of Hawaii. Um, Nicole, what is happening right now to combat this problem? Well, I want to thank HISC for having this platform and for all the speakers before that shared all the tremendous work that's been going into addressing this issue. Um, because as we all know, invasive species have detrimental impact, not just to the economy, but to the environment. And while the ranchers are currently at the forefront of this invasive species, um, all of you who are watching this webinar, we're so grateful that you're interested because as the video and the speakers mentioned, the effects of the two-line spittle bug, um, they're not only gonna affect beef production, which is tied to our ability to find food security, but the detrimental impacts um, to the ecosystem will spread to other landscapes and we wanna prevent that. So while the researchers have been working on their specific projects, um, Ranchers have been on the ground the whole time, observing, finding ways to adapt, um, and frankly, investing a lot of money on mitigation to save their pastures and prevent the spread of the bug. Um, one way you can help from wherever you are is to support the bills currently in the state legislature. And those are, right now we have House Bill 1714, um, introduced by Representative Hashem, and Senate Bill 2988, introduced by Senator Dabbard. These are both addressing two-line spittle bug uh, recovery efforts for ranchers, but also making sure that the research continues uh, because we need to find those methods to move forward and to really respond well. Uh, another bill I wanna to bring to your attention that I'm sure all of you will be interested in is HB 2200, um, which um, creates a Port of Entry Biosecurity Program, which of course is important to an island state like us. Thanks so much, Fran. Thank you, Nikki. Appreciate you being here and sharing that information with us. So 
we're going to go to questions now. And um, uh, as always, we have our, one of our, I would say our most prolific webinar attendants in uh, JB Friday. Welcome, JB. Thank you for joining us. Um, JB, I, or uh, Mark, I think this question might be for you. He uh, is saying that it's great that you're doing mapping of the susceptibility of the range, rangelands for TLSB. Is that analysis statewide or right now it's just on Hawaii Island? Uh, our mapping right now is just, uh, is he referring to the, the range, the distribution maps that we just, I displayed? I believe so, yeah. Or the more complicated stuff that we might be doing through uh, remote sensing. So <laughs> right now, the, those maps are based on our field surveys. Um, and so they're only, they all, they're only where we're finding two line spittlebug at this point. Not being done statewide. So are the susceptibility maps being worked on where you're kind of projecting where that might where it might go? Um, will that be for the state or just for Hawaii? Island? Well, that that will be applied across the state. We're, we're just getting on the ground with starting that research. And basically, now that we've collected, uh, you know, data from 2017 to, to now, we can go back um, and correlate our data with satellite imagery and the damage where we know that where the certain populations are, and we can start to to uh, identify landscapes and, and land types that are more susceptible to two line spittlebug based on elevation, precipitation, all those driving variables. And then, uh, so we want the first thing that we have to do is build the models. And so once we've got the models and we can prove those models out in this in subsequent uh, year of data collection then maybe we can apply them at, at the state level. That, that work is not done yet. That's work that we're starting on now. Great, okay. Um, we have Monty coming to us from Maui, if I'm not uh, incorrect, um, who's asking if the natural spread of TLSB is slowed or stopped by any kind of barriers uh, like if there's a forest in between, barren ground, rivers, highways, is there's kind of any kind of geographical barrier that might stop the spread? A question for me, Franny, or? Uh, sure, anybody who wants to take that one, if you. <laughs> yeah, well, we hope so. Uh, that's the first thing I can say is that we yes, we hope that there's some natural barriers. There are some, there are some habitats that I think are limiting for spittlebug when when the environment is hot and dry, um, the spittle bug is pretty limited. Uh, it, it'll it'll go away pretty quick, and the nymphs don't survive. The adults don't go feed in those zones. So there's there's some areas that I think are going to be more or less. Some areas I think are just, are are in a zone where they're going to always be infested or always have a potential to be invested. Infested. There's going to be some zones that I think the spittle bug is going to be more or less transient. It'll be there sometimes and not other times. When there's rain and there's good green grass, it'll be there. When the grass dries up, it's gonna be gone. I think there's other parts of the island that it's just gonna to be too hot and dry uh, and, and the vegetation isn't gonna support this, this spittle bug. So I think there's, there's different areas that we can think about in terms of that. On the other hand, I think there are some grasses that maybe uh, won't support two-line spittle bug uh, adult feeding um, and we tested fountain grass that, that showed up in Shannon's um, uh, research, and she noted that it's it's uh, resistant to spittlebug feeding. What we don't know, and what we what we haven't ascertained yet, and we're going to do some more trials, is whether or not they're actually feeding on the fountain grass. Fountain grass is very very high in in silica. It's a very uh, rigid grass. It, it's not really a, a very succulent type grass and it doesn't have very much quality uh, and it certainly is uh, because the spittle bug is a xylem feeder the, the fluid in the plant is under extreme amount of tension and in fountain grass that's that's even higher so it may restrict we're not even sure in the trials that Shannon did on that fountain grass whether the spittle bug adults were were feeding on that uh, grass or not and they may have not even been feeding on it so um, uh, so that's something we've got to sort out uh, whether it just evades 
the feeding by the adult because it's just a really nasty grass, or if if the you know the spittle bugs just um, can't survive on it. Anyway, so there's a whole area uh, between uh, Waimea and Kuvava that is, you know, I don't know, forty some thousand acres of uh, fountain grass, and it's a pretty dry, tough zone. It doesn't have a lot of soil. Um, it's it's dry. It's hot and uh, all fountain, primarily fountain grass. So we're hoping that that's a barrier. Um, so right now, um, I think the spread that we've observed is primarily through uh, the natural uh, distribution of the of the spittle bug. Once it kills the grasses in some areas, the adults pick up and they fly to the next zone, and that you know is typically not very far. the The question about the forest. Um, uh, it's, we feel that the spittle bug probably avoids uh, shady areas and the forested areas, although we don't know that for sure. But working with uh, Dan Peck, who's done a lot of spittle bug research uh, in South America and, and elsewhere, um, you know, these grass feeding spittle bugs tend to be um, open space, you know, grassland feeders. So they they tend to avoid those uh, forested areas. So, um, but we haven't, you know, we haven't observed any dead patches. I see Carolyn, Carolyn's got her hand up. So maybe she's got something to come. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the folks in our Kona field office have been working with some forest landowners and where there is some grass in the understory, they are observing spittlebug impacts. They are getting weedier. Um, plant communities move in and seeing some impacts to the grass. Um, when the forest is more intact, like that beautiful picture behind Franny, obviously there's no host plants for them, not, not, not as much, not as good a host plants for them. And so we haven't seen any kind of impact there. Um, I do want to say that the, although the Mark made really excellent points, um, climate is going to limit spittlebug to some degree, but the, the biggest risk we have for vectoring and for the plant for the bug to move into other areas is by human transport, particularly the movement of soil or, or um, plant material. Potted plants can carry these bugs. Um, soil and sod, especially moved out of that area, can, can be a very, very high risk activity that could move uh, two-line spittlebug eggs or nymphs or um, you know, depending on what type of a potted plant, maybe even an adult out of the Kona area into uninfested areas. And so that is one thing that we really want to bring awareness to and make sure that people know that it's, it's very, very high risk right now to, to, to um, the movement of this bug um, and just discourage that kind of movement as much as possible. Yeah, that's a really great point, Carolyn, and thanks for, for bringing that up. I know when I had first uh, talked to the entomologist who first ID'd two-line spittlebug back in 2016 and said, how do you think this got here? Um, his best guess was that it came in on a potted plant that was sold, you know, at a nursery. It was just, you know, a little tiny nymph buried in the soil and that probably you know we all we know it infests lawns we've had reports especially kona palisades that area of, of you know that slope of Hualalai, that people have said they found it in their lawns so we do know that um it moves in and around with people and that that's likely how it snuck into hawaii so um really important especially for folks in that area moving in and out to be thinking about uh, that biosecurity of what they're they're bringing in and out um, because it does have such a huge economic impact. And that's one of the um, questions that we have in our Q&A from Bill. He's asking if anybody knows the value on a percentage basis that's lost when an acre of prime ranch land um, gets a heavy infestation of TLSB. So does anybody have any sense of those economic costs to the ranchers? Is there any projections, models. I know that if you watch the, uh, the that 30 minute video that we put the link in the chat, I know that some ranchers talked about culling a third to a half of, of herds because of lost forage. And I imagine that's a significant amount. Does anybody want to speak to that? But maybe Nikki could speak to that. <laughs> I don't have an answer um, to that question, but what you are mentioning is Kind of just shows the impact that some of these ranchers who have been doing this for generations have been having to call their herds by up to a half. Um, once those 
herds are culled back that much, it takes a long time to bring it back up again, um, which means we're moving in the opposite direction of where we wanna be with increasing the amount of food production we're doing on island. Um, I think that's a good question, the percentage basis loss, but um, I think that might be a difficult question to answer, but something we should look into. Um, Mark or Carolyn, do you have an answer, an easy answer to that? Well, we're, we're kind of looking into a few things. And, I, and the, the, the first thing is that if we just look at our, our livestock production uh, across the state on a, on a per acre basis and uh, the, the value of that livestock production, um, you know, uh, that average is about $600 uh, uh, per acre of value to the state. That's not to the rancher per se, but that's, you know, the economic value of livestock grazing on a per acre basis across the state. So it, you lose an acre of ground, the, we lose about $600 per acre in revenue uh, from livestock production across the state. So you can think about that if, you know, so it's, uh, it, that's not necessarily the rancher's value that, that that's there. So I, I should clarify that a little bit. But um, you know, for for a rancher, if, if it kind of depends on the stocking rate. I find, you know, every piece of ground is a little different, and not every piece of ground carries the some same number of animals. So the the question is, it depends. <laughs> and and I it, most people hate to hear that, but that's really the case. And so you know, where the heaviest infestations are that some of our most productive livestock uh, land it's there and, and you know, three acres, you know, so stocking rate could be conservatively about three acres to the animal for per year. So, you know, you're talking a third of an animal. So you're probably talking somewhere between, you know, depending on the market value for the animal at that point in time, anywhere from 350 to uh, $400. Um, of loss on a per acre basis, um, economically staggering for the ranch. You know, and we're not talking these these infestations are not. You know, they're not small. They're not one acre. You know, they're coming in and they're taking out a hundred acres at a time. You know, I've seen I've seen uh, you know two hundred acres, two hundred and fifty acres just wiped out in, in, in a matter of a year and a half, and. So it's not a small amount of land that's getting impacted. It's very large pieces of land, very contiguous pieces of land that get wiped out. So, and it's economically devastating to the rancher to lose that grazing, but to recover that, I mean, that's a huge out-of-pocket cost to come in and try, and these are, as Carolyn pointed out, these lands are not really conducive to coming in and uh, going in and doing a lot of cultural practices. You, it, they're rough, they're steep, they're rocky, uh, soils are shallow, and so uh, recovery is going to be difficult and, uh, and very costly for these ranchers. Yeah, that was my, I was going to comment that we've, we've been running some numbers and, you know, it does vary depending on the degree of severity of the impact and what types of weeds have moved in and gotten established, but recovery of these lands can cost hundreds of dollars an acre too. So there's a loss of production that impacts a rancher for as many years as it takes until they can recover that land. And recovery can cost three, four, five hundred dollars an acre, depending on how severely damaged and invaded it got. And that process does not happen quickly either. You saw my my trials. I mean, we're over a year, and we still have a lot of weeds, and we but we're getting grasses. It's going to be a multi-year process to recover the productive capacity of lands that are severely impacted. As this bug is here and it's it's invading these environments, you know, we're really trying to pay careful attention of the ecology and how the disturbance patterns run in order to try and get an idea on is there uh, are there are there um, points in that transition trajectory that we can, we, we're, we're, if, if we get in, let's say at an earlier stage of infestation and damage and, and can find a strategy for, you know, uh, getting some seed down, for example, in these grass plots that are dying before the weeds can get established, can we successfully establish grass at that point and, and, and get ahead of the, the weed um, explosion? That's kind of been a big focus for me now um, and, and trying to see what methods might we try to use to try to try to affect that? But it's still very difficult because as Mark said, 
these it's, these when it gets bad, you can see a 200 acres of pasture disappear in a relatively short amount of time. You know, um, I've got one rancher that says he'll leave on, on a week, a Friday, and he can come back on Monday, and all of a sudden there's a dead patch where there wasn't one when he left. You know, and, and when that starts to happen and building up over the course of a couple of weeks or a month of a summer, and now you've got all these acres of grass that has died, um, you've really got to be strategically in a, in a position to respond to that. And that's difficult. Ranchers are busy as, enough as it is. So this isn't like, a, a, oh, well, why don't they just, you know, pearl out some grass seeds? So if it was that easy, that'd be great. But grass seed is very expensive. It's very hard to get, and it's difficult to get it out on the land. So there are lots of challenges that we're trying to be very creative. And you know, these ranchers, I really, my hats go off to them because they are some of the hardest working, most committed, most loyal people you'll ever meet. Um, they are just killing themselves, doing everything that they can to try to find solutions. And it's really a a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to work with them and. Just, just try to get whatever good information we can into their hands so that they can make good informed decisions. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's that's so important that people, you know, who don't really access these areas, having had the opportunity to get out there and, and see these impacted pasture lands, like really don't realize the challenge of what those landscapes look like and, and just the sheer scale of when weeds come in. We're not talking a bare patch of lawn that you could just sprinkle. I mean, there's huge patches of blackberry and all kinds of thorny things, and, and it's just sort of like, now where where does that grass seed go how do you compete with that and uh you know that's you know something on the conservation side where we're looking at this as you know this potentially cascading environmental issue where all of that propagule pressure that's bumping up against native forests it's just weeds that are replacing these grasses and now you have that pressure of those weeds on those native forests it's a real concern um i think there was a question actually kavehi on facebook something to do with with the work that you're doing carolyn with the grasses i believe yeah there's a question from dana she asked if i wanted to plant seed what would you suggest so i know shannon had mentioned a few species but if you could go over that you know it's gonna really um, um matter a lot where her land is located um there's different grasses are adapted to different environments and then applying to that to that screening uh for two line spittle bug resistance um it would be would, would be a part of that process um i'd really recommend if she's really looking to get some good advice uh to reach out to the kona field office we've got staff there that can help her look up her land get a feeling for what her soils are what her rainfall is what her elevation is what are some possible compatible species of grass that she might be able to consider and then we'd be able to access mark's information as far as uh, resistance as well and give her um, the best information that we have right now for what might be a good option that would be my suggestion the kona field office you can find their contact information on our website. I'll put it in the chat, but it's www.pia.nrcs.usda.gov. There's a contact us um, tab and you can find uh, contact information for all our offices all across the state. Thank you. Great, and I think we'll put the uh, biscuithawaii.edu in the chat. You can, if you need to speak to any of our speakers, you can always contact us at BISC and we will get you in touch with them. Um, Jade Kavehi, is there any questions that we have missed? There's a couple in the, the Zoom couple chat. In the, yeah, there's a couple in the chat. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Jade, you wanna give, give the uh, question? Uh, do we know if the TLSB can move with cattle transport? My, my answer to that is it's it's um, not not likely. I mean, you know, so the adults are very skittish. They fly, they jump, they don't stick around on things. Um, so uh, I think I think the pro it, it, I think it's possible to transport it in a vehicle or on a piece of equipment and a trailer or something like that. But I think the probability of that is pretty low. Um, the nymphs don't move. They're uh, they can't live outside of their spittle mass. Um, they're very close to the ground, and so they're not going to move. So I think the I think the probability of the the nymphs being or or the spittlebug being moved through transportation is pretty low, with the exception of what Carolyn highlighted, and that's the transportation of soil 
and plant material. And so if you're kicking up a lot of mud and dirt and, and, and what we're really concerned with is really not the nymph, which you can see, or the adult, which is gonna get up and fly away, but it's that egg that's laying in that soil that you cannot see, right? And that can get into those pots, it can get into that sod, it can get into the soil, and that's what can be transported. And then that egg can hatch in, in, in the right environment somewhere. So I think that's a concern. But I don't think we have to worry too much. It's, it, I think there's some precautions that everybody can take with equipment and, and movement of, uh, you know, equipment around. But I think, and then just following those precautions, I think it's going to be pretty safe. Okay, Jade, uh, another one? Um, there's, a, there's a couple more, um, but I'm going to kind of lump these two together. Um, someone just made a comment, or Bill made a comment for Carolyn, that you can also use green panel traps buried in the grass to use as detection. Uh, you guys might want to chat about that later. Um, but he was also asking, um, like, where spittlebug actually came from. Does snow have anything to do with uh, the suppress suppressing it? Question was, it, does snow have anything to su suppressing it? Yeah, or, or sorry, um, other than snow, what suppresses uh, spittlebug? Drought. Drought, yeah. Drought. yeah. I see another question related to um, grass species substitution being an effective strategy to maintain pastures in the southeastern US. So when this problem first came out, first thing I did was contact some of my counterparts in the southeast to ask them, how do you guys do this? How do you survive spittlebug? And the uh, key takeaways that I got from these conversations was, number one, they said, I don't think our problem is as bad as yours. Their grass forages are more diverse. They have other species. They don't have these large, you know, almost monotypic Kikuyu or Pangola types of pastures that are this vulnerable to two-line spittlebug, number one. Um, number two, when they do have pastures that do have a lot of spittlebug damage, um, they have other cultural, um, you know, agricultural pra practices that they use to, to, to combat it. They will burn a pasture off, for example. They'll do a prescribed burn and they'll, and I think a fire would effectively, um, you know, limit uh, and, and do, do some damage to a spittlebug population. They will disc up a pasture and plant it to other, to other grasses and grasses that are maybe more um, resistant. Um, because the bug is native to the southeastern United States, there's probably also other natural native biological um, in uh, controls in their environment that also help to moderate that population so that they're not as um, explosive as they as they are here because it's a relatively new uh, organism in our environment um, it we we may not have had enough time to see whether there's going to be anything in our environment that does help to limit it or not um, we we've done a lot of research and reading and there's a ton of information on the two line spittlebug website that's also posted in the chat www.tlsbhawaii.com. I've got links to all kinds of papers. I've already collected them all. So I said, here, anybody wants to read about this, come and check it out. Um, there's been research into um, other types of potential biocontrols, but there really hasn't been anything promising. There are some, some comments made in some of the papers about other um, organisms in its native environment that are known to predate on the two-line spittlebug, but none of those have really proven to be um, potential candidates for biological control at this point. And, I, and I'll point out too in the Southeast and, and uh, Carolyn brought up, you know, natural things that might limit that population. But in the, in the Southeast, they can get pretty cold temperatures. They can get a cold snap. They can get a freeze in the ground. They can, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think those things killed, you know, kill the eggs in the soil. And so from year to year, they don't have these uh, exponential increases in the population that we get. And that's, that's really what's causing, you know, the, the amount of damage that we see from one year to the next. And um, to more to the point of the question about substitution of grasses, um, and and I, I think Carolyn's spot on in terms of the southeast United States and they're they're uh, addressing the the two line spittlebug, but um, South America, uh, Brazil and Colombia um, deal with not just one variety of grass feeding spittlebug, but multitudes of grass feeding spittlebugs. And 
Uh, they've been working on it for a long, long time. And their answer to that and, and what they've determined is in the long-term sustainable uh, management of these grass feeding spittle bugs is that you have to develop grasses that are resistant to spittle bug feeding. A number of the grasses that Shannon tested uh, this past year are varieties of grasses that have been developed by uh, by a couple different uh, seed companies, research companies down in Colombia and uh, Brazil. And we were able to get those seed. Um, a couple of them are not, are right now not commercially available. Um, <clears throat> we agreed to test them out with the idea that maybe they could be made to be commercially available in the future. And so they are varieties of grasses that are, uh, have been hybridized with uh, Mirandu, the one, the one that always shows up as being very resistant. Uh, Brachiaria brisantha, that grass is the base for the spittle bug resistance in all of the uh, Brachiaria species that we've been testing, which are uh, Mulatto 2, uh, the Sabia, the Cayman, the Cayenne, uh, they're all Brachiaria varieties, hybrid varieties based on Brachiaria brisantha. And that's been the answer for South America is basically develop grasses that are spittle bug resistant. I think that's our long term strategy is to find enough grasses that have resistance um, to spittle bug feeding, get them incorporated into our, our pasture systems um, in the future. We're, we're testing as many grasses as we can, we're looking at other varieties. Um, we have a number of different challenges in those grasses because from low elevation to the high elevation, we have different climate variables that affect those grasses. And as Carolyn pointed out uh, with regards to what seed to plant, it really depends on where you're at. If you're in a high elevation zone, you're not going to be really successful planting, you know, something that's not going to grow there. So, you know, we're looking at for varieties of grasses that we can uh different zones. So right now we're pretty confident that we can populate, you know, from about 1500 foot elevation to about 3000 foot elevation, but above that, I think we're we're there's a, there's only a few grasses that are are there, but uh, we've tested a number of them. So anyway, Wow, I mean the challenges are many. Um, I think we're we're well, we're kind of past time. So uh, if anybody has any lingering questions that we didn't get to tonight, I just encourage you to reach out to the folks uh, on here. Or again, you can email us at bisc at hawaii.edu. And I just want to say thank you to all of our presenters tonight and Shannon, who couldn't be here but but shared her work with us, um, Hawaii and and our agricultural economy we're really lucky to have you guys on this and and it's clear that you're all so passionate about this work and i think um it's really impressive everything that you 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 guys have been accomplishing um so thank you again for being here tonight and thanks to everybody who's watching uh the recording should be available in a couple of days and we make a quick shout out on 643 pest if you Absolutely. are in an environment and you um especially outside the Kona area but anywhere and you see two lion spittle bug and you know it's a two lion spittle bug get a picture and call 643 pest or get on the 643 pest website or download the 643 pest app and you can report it it's they are already prepared to receive those reports so if you um if you see it anywhere please please report it and get a picture if you can thank you um spittle bug season is coming they're going to be emerging and, and their numbers are going to be climbing over the next several months so keep your eyes out thanks Yep. We always need those eyes and ears. Thanks, Carolyn. Anybody else have any closing thoughts? If not, thank you very much. Aloha.